So, what makes a B-movie? Before I get into this video, the question becomes, what, what makes a B-movie? There's a few criteria that I use to describe a B-movie. A B-movie can be high budget, but, but terrible. A movie that is shot seriously with serious actors doing serious things and a serious director that when you put it together and you put it on a screen, I always picture the cast and director watching it together and going, oh my god, this is awful. How did this happen? And I wonder often how many actors partway through a movie project will realize the movie they're starring in is awful, but they've signed a contract so they have to finish it. Directors too. That you know, the part with your directing a movie, and they realize, wow, this is this is potentially a career killer. What am I doing here? B movies can also be really low budget, fantastic movies. My favorite one currently, and I don't have it on D on Blu-ray or DVD, but I plan to buy it. Is Kung Fury. Kung Fury is thirty minutes, and it's a movie, and even though those things shouldn't go together, they do, and it is. Not in my collection, so it doesn't make the top 10. So what I'll do is I will put a link in the description here for this video to Kung Theory. I recommend it to anybody who hasn't watched it. It is the greatest 30 minutes ever put to film. And I'm not exaggerating. I've watched the movie so many times. It is fantastic. It's got everything. Um, I even follow Eleni Young, who plays Barbariana in the movie, because she's gorgeous and she's funny. And she constantly promotes Kung Fury. So she understands that her career is potentially getting off the ground here. Being attractive and young will do that for you. And that this movie, with its cult following, will get her a cult following. Smart girl. Cult movies are also B-movies. For the most part. Um... Certain movies have sort of a cult-like following, like Fight Club, Goodfellas, Donnie Darko, but I don't qualify any of that as B-movies. They're all A-grade movies, A-grade directors, that just acquire a cult following from having something cool in them. Goodfellas has the fantastic camera work, and the fact that it's grounded somewhat in reality, and that, I mean, they, they, you know, they, they definitely exaggerate parts of it just to make it more dramatic for the screen. But it is, it is a fantastically acted movie. And, you know, one scene that occurs to me the most is, you know, De Niro calling on the phone, looking for Pesci, realizes what's going on, and he just starts beating the phone up on the receiver, and you see tears in his eyes. And it's, it's that kind of simplicity that makes Goodfellas fantastic. It's not the over-the-top violence. It is, it is those moments. And Scorsese is a master of those moments. Um... Donnie Darko is a fantastic movie, start to finish. I'm not a B-movie. Uh, Fight Club, fantastic. I think there are more man quotes in Fight Club than the next five man movies put together. Oh god, they've got Jessica Alba and Stephen, uh, Stephen Colbert. She's very distracting. I have to not watch her. Now, <clears throat> my god, if only she could act. It's... <laughs> <laughs> it's a, the other that's the other side of B movies too is that in many cases the acting in B movies is not stellar. Um it can be. Now in, in Kung Fury it's fantastic. I mean when you know girl goes, Yeah, that's my bicep. It is one of the greatest deliveries of a line in the history of the world. And Hitler is hilarious. Hitler is amazing. Um, I never thought I'd see the day that I said Hitler is amazing in real life, but I did. I did that. So, it, with that being said, I went through my movies and I said, okay, B-movies are either cheaply made, they're expensive, but they turn out bad, or they've got a cult following and they're not bright, shiny movies. They're not ones that have gained a cult following and have a name in it like Brad Pitt or Jake Johan uh, Jake Johansson uh, Jake Gyllenhaal Gyllenhaal I always said Gyllenhaal and then I found it was Gyllenhaal and I still sometimes have a problem with that name because Gyllenhaal doesn't sound right to me my brain goes Gyllenhaal um, so with that perspective I said okay 10 
10 cult movies. So is Nightmare on Elm Street in here? No. Nightmare on Elm Street is an iconic, classic movie now. Made for small budget, but not really a B-movie, because everything about the original Nightmare on Elm Street is a fantastic film. Um, when my kids got old enough that they were able to start watching horror movies, I was uh, I had to ease them to that point, because Elm Street is one of those movies that feels very real because of its low budget. And that's one of the reasons I like low budget, because when you have the low budget and the single cam, and you don't have the bright studio lighting, I think it makes a movie feel more real. You believe these are real people. It's part of the reason Blair Witch was such a hit when it came out. Now they're trying to recreate it, and I, I don't know if this quasi-sequel is going to be any good or not. I'll give it a shot. I don't know that I'll see it in the theater, but I'll give it a shot. So with that criteria in mind, here's my top ten. Uh, at number 10 is Phantasm 2. I saw this in the theater. Um, I remember the commercial for this was The Ball is Back. And my friends and I, we all said the same thing. Back from where? We'd never heard of the original Phantasm. We didn't know who the tall man was. Uh, the world lost Angus Scrim last year, who played the tall man. Uh, the tall man is one of the great villains in the history of horror movies. The only thing with the Phantasm movies is, and I've watched all of them, None of them make sense compared to the others. So part two is a universal in and of itself. You get to part three. Part three wipes out part two in the first five seconds and starts a whole new narrative. Part four starts a whole new narrative. And then the ending of part four must have enraged some people. I enjoyed it because basically it shows part four ending with the start of part one. So it's like they're caught in this endless loop that Mike and Reggie are caught in this endless loop trying to stop the tall man, and they can't. But they're they're stuck in, in there for forever, trying to stop them from basically wiping out the world and turning into what I used to call evil Jawas. Um, Phantasm 2 has not got a big budget, but some of the effects, while they look corny by today's standards, it is dark, and it is, it is horror. It's, it's got a couple of comedic moments, but it is it is a horror movie. And it, it I remember in the theater, it made me jump three or four times. My friend Marcus, it was three or four seats down, it made him jump every two seconds. Um, it got to the point where I wouldn't even have to turn. I'd be like, Marcus, Marcus, because I knew it was him that was jumping. He was scared to death. Um, and that was in our midnight showing days. I miss midnight showings in theaters. For this very reason. Movies like this were fantastic. And it, it doesn't happen anymore. Number nine. Fido. Now Fido is a movie that has Billy Connolly playing a zombie. And Carrie Ann Moss playing uh, as part of the family that takes care of him. You end up cheering for a zombie eating a child in this movie. If you haven't seen it before, watch it. It is one of the funniest send-ups on zombie movies I've ever seen. Before you ask, no, Shaun of the Dead is not in this list. Shaun of the Dead is, again, a fantastic movie that I don't qualify as a t technically a B-movie. This, to me, is. Because it got virtually no press when it came out. I don't remember that it made any money at the theater, really. And... It, it did it did an amazing job of, of turning the zombie culture on its ear by taking zombies and projecting them back into 1950s America. Great, great movie. Number eight, still in its cellophane, because I'm telling you, someday somebody's going to sit and watch this with me and they're going to be amazed. Black Dynamite. I don't like black, black exploitation films from the 70s. I never did. But this is great. Great. Great stuff. And I have to admit, it's Michael J. White that plays the main character in this, right? And he was Spawn. Now, I love the Spawn movie. No, it's not in the top ten. It's not here, because I don't qualify that as a B-movie either. Spawn was supposed to be the start of a franchise, and it wasn't because Spawn was just too dark to be a superhero. I think if you made a Spawn movie now, I think you could cash in and make $100, 150000000 million on it. 
this movie is fantastic, and you don't need to enjoy it, black exploitation movies to get it. There's a scene with heroin addicted children that has to be seen to be believed. You are very amused. You laugh your ass off watching it, and then you have a moment of, oh my god, what did I just laugh at? It is amazing for that alone. Number seven. Iron Sky. There are views online where people hate this movie. They hate it. I love this movie for a number of reasons. First off, it's it's in German. A lot of it's in German. Second off, when a black guy goes to these Nazis on the moon, Nazis on the moon is a reason to watch this alone. They, uh, they turn them white. And send them back to Earth. Um, and and it's it is uh, so much fun. Uh, Julia Dietze, and I hope I'm saying that right, Dietze or Dietz. Julia Dietz is fantastic in this movie. She is. She manages to take a movie that's silly, and this is a silly movie, I mean, it's Nazis on the Moon, and her character shows an arc. And at the end of the movie, it's really dramatic. The end of this movie is shockingly dramatic, and if you haven't seen it, I'm not going to ruin it for you. But this movie has a dark, dark finish. And Sarah Palin is president of the United States. And as much as we laughed back then, this is ridiculous. Now Donald Trump could be president of the United States. I don't know if we'd rather have Palin. Anyways, it is it is an amazing movie. And I really enjoy it. I highly recommend it. Number six. Killer Clowns from Outer Space. They, they hunt people using a balloon animal. Balloon animal dog that barks. They encase their victims in cotton candy on their spaceship. A spaceship which looks like a circus tent. That's their real faces. And it's awesome. And each clown has its own look and its own walk. And it's... The movie never takes itself seriously for a minute. But it's pretty gory. And it's pretty pretty violent considering it's about clowns and if you're scared of clowns this is a great movie for you it's fantastic i really enjoy this movie quite a bit um and and for the record i was never a clown person uh when i was a little kid and my dad wanted to buy me a clown showing me in the sears um sears catalog and and i wanted a stuffed monkey instead i got the monkey he kept wanting me to buy the clown, and it's a good fucking thing I never got the clown. Because the clown that my dad wanted to buy me is the same clown the kid had in Poltergeist. So that clown would have got burned after I saw the movie Poltergeist as a little kid. Alright, number five. I've mentioned this before. Ugly, woman, Amy, jungle, jungle, bad gorillas, bad gorillas, Amy, Amy, ugly, woman, the talking gorilla and stop eating my sesame cake. I cannot recommend this movie enough. Bruce Campbell dies in the very beginning of this. And he's awesome. Now, Laura Linney, I enjoy her in this movie even though I hated her in Truman Show. And, and it was a good thing. Like, she played her character so well in The Truman Show that I kind of hated her in every movie she was in after that because I still saw the wife from The Truman Show, who I thought was evil. But this is a fun movie. And Ernie Hudson's in it, of course, who's from um, Ghostbusters. Uh, Joe Don Baker, who uh, the MST3K group has, has a history with. I cannot... If, you, if you've ever watched Mystery Science Theater 3000, if you have never watched Mystery Science Theater 3000... It is available on YouTube, the entire episode, Mitchell. It is one of the greatest send-ups ever 
It is one of the greatest satires ever. And because Joe Don Baker, who's a big man and is in this movie, uh, was so angry at Mitchell being treated such as such, um, I believe it was Joel who was at a, a convention avoided and ducked Joe Don Baker the whole time because he was he was afraid of getting his ass kicked. And he felt like that was a legit fear because of what they did with Mitchell. And it's it's funny because Mitchell is is genuinely uh <laughs> remember one line where Mitchell asks Linda Evans would, would you like a beer? And uh Joel says was it Joel or Mike? Yeah I keep I think in it was Mike at this point, because it's the episode where Joel gets away. Um, no, Joel gets away at the end. Um, was it Mitchell? Anyways, the the comment from the peanut gallery is, some of them got cigarette butts in them. And it just... The white trash lines thrown out there for Joe John Baker were awesome. So he's in this, and he's campy in this, and he's over the top. And you laugh at him. Even though he's trying to put in a serious performance. Tim Curry's in this. Tim Curry's amazing. He is uh, slimy, underhanded, and ruthless, and awesome. So, Because that's what Tim Curry was in almost everything he was in. Number four. I did a whole video on the series. And I thought, I could count part two. But you know what? I'm only going to do one. This movie was made for very little money. This movie took years to make there are scenes towards the end of the movie where the actors have been subbed out with with doubles because it took them so long that they couldn't get the actors to come back and do these shoots and the reshoots this is a relentless gore-filled movie that tried in vain to get an r rating and i don't know why they thought they'd be able to get an r rating with some of the horrific violence and gore that's in this movie and yet, it's lighthearted and entertaining for the most part. When I was younger, when I was a kid, I used to get kind of an icky feeling in my gut after I watched this. Mostly uh, because of the chick in the basement there. Yeah, that face haunted me when I was a kid. I remember when I watched this the first time I was 11 years old. Um, it really, really messed me up. I couldn't sleep for a couple days and I had a really hard time with nightmares for like a week after. And I still, to this day, have nightmares that are influenced by this movie. So, it's like 30 years later, I am still having nightmares. And I will wake up from those nightmares just feeling gross and icky. And it's movies, it's 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 movies. They feel like movies. They're dreams with, with these horrible demonic things that are after me and trying to possess me. And these horrible, horrible images... And I wake up, and the first thing I say out loud is, that was an evil dead dream. The movie inspires nightmares. Not just, you have bad dreams. You have bad dreams based on the movie. Number three, let me in. Now, I will say this. If you have a chance to watch the original Norwegian version, let the right one in, do it. Do it now. Go find it and do it. This is the American version. The American version is basically a scene-for-scene -scene reshoot. There's some extra stuff in this, some background on her, um, about a, a little girl who's a vampire and her trying to survive. Uh, played fantastically in this movie by Chloe Moritz. I had been a fan of Chloe Moritz from Kick-Ass, but her part in Kick-Ass is basically just her talking tough and swearing, and it's, it's a little girl swearing. This movie, there's real depth. And this was when I went, okay, Chloe Moritz has some serious talent. If she can avoid getting into a Lindsay Lohan style career, then she can actually make something of this. And I still believe to this day that Chloe Moritz has a lot of talent, despite Dark Shadows, despite the fact that she did Neighbors 2, which I understand had some good reviews. I'm just saying, if she wants to be the next Meryl Streep or the next Helen Mirren, um, Helen Mirren, she has to, um, you know, not necessarily be careful with what she picks, but y y you got to watch. You got to watch which way your career is going. Are you being taken seriously? Or kind of just as eye candy? 
this movie is is disturbing. It uh, doesn't shy away from some really, really, really dark stuff. And it it is the one movie that answers the question: well, What happens if a vampire enters your home without you inviting them? Why is that a rule? And it's a very graphic way of showing that you you have to invite them in, or bad things happen to that vampire. Number two, I got a review for this on my main channel, Highway to Hell. Highway to Hell is an HBO movie that was recently released on, on Blu-ray and DVD. This movie has inspired more thoughts in my brain related to writing than anything else. It is a simple story. It has Patrick Bergen playing um, Beazle, who I think is awesome. Here you have the Hell Cop, whose name is Sergeant Bedlam. Look at that, Sergeant Bedlam. And the Hell Cop, look at all the writing on his face. Like, it is it is amazing, and it's all evil, satanic symbols and writing, and it's it's awesome. Uh, Chad Lowe plays in this, but don't turn it off. Uh, don't look and go, oh, Chad Lowe, where'd they find him? Don't worry about it. Uh, this was in the mid-90s when Chad Lowe was still a thing. It also features uh, Ben Stiller. It features his mom and dad as well. And they have really cool little cameos. There's some dark stuff in this. Lita Ford has a uh, cameo in this. Lita Ford. And uh, i got to say, they made her look really sexy in this movie. Not for long, but, you know, she was in it. Uh, yeah, there it is. Jerry Stiller, uh, Ben Stiller's um, dad. And then Ann Mira, who's the mom. And Amy Stiller who is Ben Stiller's sister, is in this as Cleopatra. Ben Stiller plays uh, Attila the Hun, but he also plays... I think there's two other characters he plays in this movie. I know he plays uh, the guy who's cooking on the pavement. So basically, the pavement in hell, you can actually cook breakfast on it. And he's entertaining in it, which is weird, because Ben Stiller has two characters he plays in movies. He's either the nerdy, awkward guy... Or he's the prick. And in this movie, he's just kind of weird. And it's different to see him playing that. And in this, there's a theme. Gilbert Gottfried as Hitler is amazing and has to be seen to be believed. Gilbert Gottfried as Hitler. I don't know what better way there is to sell it than that. This movie's available, I believe, on YouTube. I think you can find the entire movie. Uh, I bought it because I wanted it in high def. And I wanted to support the movie. Sometimes I buy physical copies of movies because I want to support the movie makers. I want to support the content providers. I think that's important. So that's why I've got so many physical DVDs. And also so that if something happens to my internet, I don't go, I can't watch anything. Number one, my favorite of the B-movies I own is Night of the Comet. Night of the Comet is... I can't... I can't rave about this movie enough it came out it was 84 that it came out which was the greatest year in history for me anyways um in 1984 for me music was fantastic movies were fantastic tv was great um i i really i look back on 84 with tremendous tremendous affection and this movie about earth passing through the tail of a comet and that radiation from this comet wiping out 99% of the world's population is fantastic. Catherine Murray Stewart, who played the girlfriend on um, Last Starfighter, which I also have and is a fantastic movie. Not a B-movie. Fantastic movie in its own right. She also played the girlfriend in Weekend at Bernie's. Um, Catherine Murray Stewart, one of the most beautiful women I ever saw in a movie. My crush on her... Uh, was absolute and yet it wasn't there it wasn't like a sexy crush it was just i i liked everything she did everything she was in and to me she was unique uh kelly maroney's in this as well kelly maroney's known for having been in a lot of b movies she was in chopping mall which actually isn't as bad as it sounds chopping mall was actually a fun movie about these robots coming to life and killing everybody um it was basically a, a combination. If you took if you took Dawn of the Dead and Terminator and made it like and and short circuit, 
and you, <laughs> you put the three of them in a blender, you might come up with Chopping Mall. And for anybody who knows all three of those movies, you go, what? Yeah, that's the reaction you have when you watch Chopping Mall. Is, what? But Kelly Maroney makes it worth watching. It is it is a fun little movie. Uh, it also features uh, Mary Warnoff, who is known from a lot of other movies as well, uh, in terms of her um, B-movies. And Robert Beltran, who went on to be the first officer on Star Trek Voyager. So... I remember when I was watching Voyager, the first episode, and I'm like, and you're Hector. You're Hector Gomez from, from Night of the Comet. Um, and to this day, there's quotes from this movie I still use. Uh, he talks about how uh, he can fly down the highway. Man, you can you can drive that highway now. You're, you're flying like turkey crap through a tin horn. And that line stuck with me. Turkey crap through a tin horn. It's such a, a weird analogy, and I'm like, that's fantastic. So I still use that. In my everyday life, even though nobody knows it came from this movie. I've memorized this movie. I can recite it word for word. No, I'm not doing that now. But it is, it is, uh, it's great. It's absolutely great. Even editing mistakes, I think, are awesome. There's a scene at the start where the stepmother, who is played by Sharon, Sharon Farrell, is arguing and fighting with Kelly Maroney. And if you watch... Half of the scene, Kelly Maroney's shirt is down, so her bra strap's showing, and then the other half, it's up. And it keeps going back and forth and alternating. And when you see it's there, if anybody's watched the movie, you're going to go back and watch it and go, damn it, Shannon. But when you see it's there, when you, see it's there you can't unsee it. It is, <laughs> it is one of those things that's just awesome. Because it's, it's cheesy. And then when Sharon Farrell punches her in the face and she goes head over, ass over tea kettle, lands next to the TV, and the guy on the TV, the awkward reporter, goes, seems like a really nice crowd out here tonight. It is so well put together. It is, everything about it is great. So I cannot recommend this movie enough. Night of the Comet, again, this is Blu-ray. Think about it. These are 80s movies. The quality is not great. I buy them on Blu-ray to support the, the creators. I have this on DVD somewhere as well. And what I do with movies like this is simple. If somebody in my life that's important to me, whether it's a friend or whatever, says, oh, I've never seen that, I go, here, just bring it back whenever. And if I don't get it back, I buy another copy. Because there's certain movies that I think are important to share, and this is one of them. It's it's fantastic. Um and, and now that I've talked it up, I may end up watching this tonight. It is one of those movies I always feel better after I watch it. And as much as Highway to Hell uh, creatively inspired me, Catherine Mary Stewart's character in this movie, Regina, for anybody who reads any books of mine, and whether it's uh, Katie Translow in Into the Void, Catherine Webster in Into the Void, um, Casey in... Uh, not Casey, Allison in Run, uh, Casey in the new book that I'm just finishing up now. Any of these strong female characters, they're based on, on the one in the shadows here, on Catherine Mary Stewart's character, Regina, in this movie. I, I think she's the right combination of she's cute, she's funny, she's a girl, she's not tough and butch, but she knows how to handle a gun, and she knows how to fight. And it is, it is a perfect combination that, yes, she's a female, and she's tough. And sometimes in movies, it's one or the other. You have your weeping willow girl who needs a man to save her, and you have the big, tough butch chick that, you know, it, it's, it's equally offensive to me because they're, they're wooden characters and they're stereotypes. And she is neither. So it's a fantastic movie, and I highly recommend it. There you go. There's my top 10 favorite B-movies of the movies that I own. So I'd be interested to know what your favorites are. Um, and again, if you haven't seen especially the top two, watch them.